So in this panel, I would like the, the three panelists to join me on stage. Please come, so I'm not alone. Um, this panel, I think, is quite important and interesting. There was a journalist from Folha de São Paulo. He was here yesterday, and he, please sit whenever. Uh, and phone. And the journalist said, "I like the event, but quite theoretical. I don't have anything to write about." And I said, "Yeah, come to my panel because my panel is about case studies. So this panel is about." People things, uh, things people are doing. And I will say two things that are absolutely redundant. And because they are redundant, it's what makes this panel interesting. So Amazon bought uh, Whole Foods. And this is quite related to artificial intelligence. So now I was in London and Suns were recreating a new distribution systems to deliver e-purchase. And they said, no, this is stupid to deliver stuff because with artificial intelligence, you know, when people want to buy things. So Sunsbury is not competing with Amazon or wholesales because uh, they don't have artificial intelligence. The reason why I say this is redundant, because this is one of the case studies we hear all the time. We hear corporate uses of artificial intelligence for market that are really interesting. But how many case studies you have based on inclusion? How many cases you can point if someone writes an email and say, tell me three things that should people have done to tackle inclusion and artificial intelligence, and we have very few ideas. So in this panel, we have three people that will have ideas of what they are doing to tackle the issue of inclusion in artificial intelligence. And I think it's quite rare. I call it uh, strawberries in the desert uh, opportunity to have these three samples of people and their cases on what has been done. Uh, then we're going to open for questions. You can question them. And if you have an interesting case, please share, because it's rare moments where we have these case studies about AI and inclusion. So I have here with me Lucas. Um, Lucas Santana from the Zabaf Social, he's from Brazil. He's wearing a t-shirt about racial affirmative actions, which say if thing is, something is black, the thing is good. Uh, and he's going to talk about algorithm discrimination or profiling in bank images. Um, we also have here Arisa Emma from the University of Tokyo. And we have Mark uh, Sermon from Mozilla Foundation who share other stories. And I'll, I'll leave them to present themselves. Um, anyone wants to start? Mark? Yes. Uh, do we have the slides in this order or? Let's see. Wherever the slides are first, then you describe. Let me look for the gods. The god said okay. Discover this isn't going. The message from the gods is coming down. Oh, there we go. Good. All right. Okay. I guess my slides are first, so. I'll Hi, everybody. Um, if you hadn't just had a break, I would get you to stretch. It's been a long day. Um, and I, so I guess, you know, I'm going to provide four very fit, quick provocations of case studies. And so it's sort of, but it's a long one theme, which is really most of this conversation, the characters in the story have been big companies or to some degree governments and regulation. But if we want to look at inclusion or agency or self-determination or however we're going to talk about where we as people fit into this cyborg world or this world where computing is pervasive and wraps around us, then we have to look at ourselves as citizens or ourselves as people who aren't companies, who aren't agents of the government, and how do we shape, uh, and how do we shape what the reality becomes and put ourselves into the story, not just as the computed, not just as the users. And so it, it's one of the reasons that increasingly I think about the need for a social movement or an environmental movement for this digital environment, where citizens actually are shaping what's going on. And, you know, obviously in that world, the, the tactics that have worked in other movements, I mean, I, I grew up in the environmental movement and the peace movement in North America, but, you know, many movements have their own traditions of how they're trying to shape reality. The question for me and where I want to look at the case studies is how could we imagine if we wanted a, a movement for a healthier digital environment or one that is more humane and more empathetic, 
what would be some of the tactics that we would try? And it's, it's something Mozilla is really investing in is trying to encourage a movement like that to grow and support people who are doing, you know, probably the kind of work you guys are going to talk about. So I'll just give, you know, four quick case studies of types of tactics we might imagine to tackle some of the challenges we've talked about over the last day and a half on, on AI. And so the, the first is this idea that, especially in the context of machine learning, there's a huge kind of centralization of power and oligopolies, which you know, have a lot of, of negative impacts, but include that if we wanted to create a counterbalance to most of the big AIs, you know, like Alexa or Siri or these things, we actually don't have the access to the big data sets that those companies have. And so there's a barrier to competition. If we wanted something like a Firefox or like some social alternative or some alternative from different parts of the world, we actually don't have the data to start with. So one opportunity as an intervention is this one I mentioned yesterday, is that we would imagine cooperatives or commons of training data. So it's not one entity that creates the kind of training data that would allow you to build quality AI systems, but it's actually collectives. Uh, and so we actually tried an experiment with that, something called Common Voice. And what that was, uh, or is actually, is an attempt to create a training data set for voice recognition that has two benefits. One is it's a commons, so anybody can use it. And you can, if, if you go to that site, speak a sentence and help train the machine or help quality control by listening to a sentence and say, did it sound like that or not sound like that? Um, and I think we got, in a very short period of time, just kind of going out to our community, 10,000 hours uh, over the course of a couple of months of training data on, on voice. And so the, the benefits, of course, are that somebody could then use that. That's a free, open source, voice uh, recognition training data set. But also, it means that we can start to have languages that are not going to be represented by the kind of larger corpus of, uh, you know, the mainstream platforms, languages other than English, much smaller languages represented, you know, through that kind of open source approach. So that's one thing, you know, that, yes, I guess Mozilla is, a, is an organization or a company in a sense, where we're a nonprofit, but really is a citizen action of people coming and contributing to this commons. So that's one thing we could imagine doing, is more cooperatives and more commons like that. The other is to think about, like, in many ways, the challenge of not trusting the kind of products we have or the technology we live inside of. Uh, and, you know, it come, one of the things that, where this comes up a lot is in this talk about auditability or verifiability. Do we know, like, what bias was in the algorithm or how an algorithm made a decision about me? Um, or also in, in, you know, how is my data being used? Is it being used for the purposes that I... Um, you know, that I wanted it to be or being used in other ways. And so an interesting idea is to kind of take a, a page from the history of different ethical products like organic food or fair trade and look that you could tackle some of these questions or at least attempt to tackle some of these questions about verifiability, auditability, about understanding how my data is used at some systemic level by building uh, basically fair trade marks or trust marks. And so we actually just supported a, a, a paper with a group of folks called ThingsCon on building a trust mark for IoT, which really then extends a lot into AI. I mean, the two kind of often go hand in hand. So that's another strategy as citizens we could use is to look at nutrition labeling or trust labeling as something that we then either encourage companies to do or over time regulate and force companies to do on their products. And that's a way to start thinking about that at, at over a number of decades at a kind of a large scale. And so that's a real thing that we're exploring to see whether we could make happen in the industry, but driven as a, you know, as a citizen initiative and an initiative that involves researchers like some of the kind of people who are, are here in the room. And then a, a third piece, and these are really provocations of like what other tactics could we think of? These are things that we're thinking about as we imagine a, kind of more of a citizen movement around these issues, is to be more demanding customers and know that we actually have market power as people, uh, or at least those of us who choose to opt into buying these technologies as people who are buying them by making choices and also like being vocal about what is good and bad and what we want and you know, especially being vocal about what's stupid. Um, 
So one thing we just released this week is a holiday shopping guide uh, for IoT things, which helps you know, you know what things are spying on you that you're buying for Christmas. Uh, so in there, you can you know, find out that there is an Adidas soccer ball that you can buy that has a microphone, a camera. You need to re register an account to use the soccer ball uh, and, and all of these kind of things. And it, it's funny, but it also is starting to say, let's build a lexicon of knowing what we're buying, uh, especially as we imagine embedding AI and, and sensors in you know, basically all kinds of products that we use. And that's a very tried and true strategy from other movements is looking at consumer power as a way to influence how the market uh, behaves. Um, and then the last piece, which relates back to the, um, the fact that Greenpeace was my, my opening example, is really to shift the narratives and look at citizens as, you know, especially artists, people who can imagine a different future. It was just actually upstairs in the museum and it says on the wall, um, you know, what different futures can we imagine? What different tomorrows can we imagine? And so much, I think even here as we're critical of where things are going with AI and want to look at inclusion, we so much look at the narrative that's being written in Silicon Valley uh, as, you know, a narrative we're trying to negotiate inside of instead of looking at other possible tomorrows. And so one of the things I would like to see way more of and we're trying to support um, is basically uh, design fiction and other kinds of things where you're prototyping a different reality. So in, you know, there's a group of artists we've worked with, uh, including Superflux, to basically develop IoT products and AI products that won't ever exist, uh, but that do imagine a very different kind of future. Uh, and so this one, if you go and see the, the video, I'll give you the link at the end, is about this, um, basically this voice assistant that this woman has that she can dial up the different mood settings of the voice assistant. And then when she actually calls for customer service, um, you know, she starts it out nice and she starts to get more and more annoyed. And she keeps telling her voice assistant to get meaner and meaner. Uh, and this is a sort of like fantasy digital assistant she wishes she had. And of course, it's talking to the AI of the company and they're seeing these battling AIs get angrier and angrier at each other. The, the value of this, and I think the value of art uh, as a part of a political strategy in this is imagining that the future that is being painted before us doesn't have to be the future. We actually can, I mean, they're prototyping these products as real you know, objects you can touch that have real electronics in them, just never gonna go to production. So we can imagine a different future, I think, by blowing up the imagination. And the, the last thing I'll say, because uh, it says I have no time, uh, is that I actually feel, you know, pragmatically, there are ways for us to intervene and shape things. And if you think, you know, uh-oh, did I lose my other, my other slide? Is, oh, it's so sad. I have a really beautiful slide here on this screen uh, of the, the GNU mascot, the Tux Linux mascot, and the Firefox mascot at Fizzly, the open source conference here in Brazil. And, you know, we do have a history in the free software movement of being a citizen movement that did shape big parts of how the internet had worked out. It's also backfired on us a little bit. Uh, but I, I think there is, to me, the free software movement is, you know, like the, the prehistory of the environmental movement. You know, you didn't, you have had environmentalists organized for well over 100 years. But there's phases and phases and phases. And I think we have to imagine a new phase where in the free software movement, we had something we were, we were able to shape and build digital reality. I think we have to reimagine that now with strategies like these and others we can come up with so that we get a, a future that is different than the one that's being painted and the one that looks like it's unfolding around us. So that's my provocation to you is what are those strategies and how do we reinvent that movement? Thank you very much. Arisa would like to go next. Uh, so hello, uh, my name is Arisa Emma. I'm uh, from the Japan, the University of Tokyo. So I, I came 
at the other side of the earth. It took like 30 hours for I to come to here, but I really enjoyed uh, having uh, attending this symposium so far. So um, I would like to uh, talk not specifically about the technology, the AI technology, but how uh, it's kind of like a story. So how I uh, created my colleagues or like the engineers, the social scientists to be involved in this art. Uh, uh, to uh, in a group to to make more people inclu included in this uh, uh, this AI ethic to to consider the AI ethics and policy in Japan. So uh, the title is like breaking down silos. So as you can easily imagine, there is a silo has been created among in the engineers do the engineers' job, the social scientists are doing their jobs, and the policymakers are doing their jobs. So. I, I, in the two, 2030 or 40, uh, the IT, the AIs has to be considered in the, um, we, 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 we thought that it would be really important to include many people in, in Japan, the many stakeholders to discuss the AI ethics. And uh, the, this picture uh, became one opportunity to build that kind of community. So um, this is the journal cover design of the Japanese Society for Artificial Intelligence. So it's official journal cover. So uh, before the re renovation, so it was used to be like this, you know, the originally dull uh, cover design. So you could see in the, the library or so. But in 2014, they changed uh, the cover design to this like more attractive animation like uh, magazine and uh, this, uh, I, I think you could easily imagine this was criticized by from the gender perspective. So um, there, there's a lot of things that has been um, discussed, but uh, the the thing is that this this is woman uh, plucked. So it's kind of like uh, anthropomorphism of like the uh, vacuum cleaner. So she's cleaning the room, but she's plucked. And uh, some say that she, she has a hollow eye, so it seems like she's not willing to do this kind of job. So it's, it's a, and uh, uh, so, but however, uh, this uh, picture was uh, kind of chosen uh, within the community and it was, uh, it, so, sorry. So it was, it got like a first prize within the community, but, and, uh, they they saw that this was really nice because it's, it's it feels some like nostalgic way it's, it's traditional Japanese so you could see there's a, like the library and the, the the they used to have this kind of girl cleaning in the room um, traditionally. However, the thing doesn't uh, the so the criticism become bigger and bigger and the, the worst thing for them is that they want the 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 news went into the global. So the BBC News wrote the article saying, uh, Japan, artificial servant girls sparks sexism role. So this kind of, oops, sorry, um, article uh, went into the global. And uh, so, however, so I wasn't involved in this community, uh, in this uh, editorial board at this time, but the thing I found is that there was uh, two, uh, Opinions. So one say that uh, this is really good. It's it's really nost nostalgic and impressive cover. However, they found out when they released these issues, uh, the public thought that uh, this have more gender issues, and uh, it it has like a you need to think about the political correctness and the other thing. So uh, the AI researchers realized that uh, this. They, they have social imp impact on what they uh, represent. And so they started to discuss uh, their social impact with uh, not only within the community, but including the philosophers or the anthropologists or social STS researcher like me and law or sociology. So we are creating this kind of community uh, in right now. And I think this was a really good opportunity to discuss this. And uh, also we actually wrote the uh, paper together uh, about this topic and uh, like ethics and social responsibility. What should we do and what, uh, who to be included in this kind of communication. So uh, this was 
2014, and uh, the ethical board was actually organized within this Japanese Social uh, Society for Artificial Intelligence in 2014, and uh, I was invited to the uh, the society, the ethical committee, and uh, we started to discuss well what we can do to. Um, say that the public that we are not, you know, the mad scientist. So uh, to the conclusion is that why, why, why shouldn't we create the ethical guidelines and show it to the public and to start discussion? So uh, the, you could see these nine articles and the, the most of them is, uh, you know, it's, it's the common thing that it's really more like the code of ethics to the most uh, uh, engineers, the contribution to humanity or the fairness, security, act with integrity. But um, the, the unique thing is that the Article 9, abidance of ethics guideline by AI. So it says that AI must abide by the policies described above, above means one to eight, in the same manner as the members of JSI, in order to become a member of a quasi member of society. So here, uh, in this guidelines, we treated AI as not as just a tool, but they aims to treat AI as our partners, not like a human beings, but as a quasi member of society. So this uh, article captured a lot of um, interest and also the criticism, like how are we considering about the rights and also like the obligation or like duty and uh, so that kind of thing. So we were not thinking so much in depth, but uh, I think uh, this is kind of like a unique uh, view, way of uh, thinking about uh, how we treat AI, how we build the relationship between AI or how we collaborate with AI in the future. And also, uh, this is uh, another, the, it's not the same route, but also the government is also interested in, in creating the AI R&D principles. Uh, uh, and uh, recently, they actually released the guidelines uh, um, in the, and uh, you could read it in the English uh, in the website. So I just read the uh, core message from that. And are on guidelines. So it was um, created by the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication in Japan, and it consists of 33 participants. And it's not only from the engineers, the policymakers, but it also includes the lawyers, the social scientists. I'm also involved in there. And uh, so it has, uh, so it also has the nine principles here. So the, the guideline aims to protect the interest of users and deter the spread of risks, thus realizing a human-centered wisdom network society by way of increasing the benefits and mitigating the risks of AI system through the sound progress of AI networks. And also, it, as you can see, they list the principle of collaboration was the first principle. And uh, as you can see, the transparency, safety, security, privacy issues is listed. Also, uh, they uh, created the users guidelines, well, usage guidelines. They, they want to create usage guidelines, but before that, they did some kind of case studies uh, in this uh, five, six fields. And in Japan, um, as you can see, uh, we want to, uh, within so not only within the stakeholders, like the engineers, scientists, the public, or the policymakers, we also want to be involved in the global networks like this symposium. And in the October, we held the uh, symposium called AI and Society, and we invited the person, mostly from the West, and we discussed about uh, how we could build the beneficial AI. And uh, to do so, we had, we, we have the partner from like all over the world, like the IEEE or the CFI or the West. And also uh, in Japan, like we have like a Japan Deep Learning Association, which promotes or the enhance the competitiveness of industry by deep learning certification systems. Or like uh, we have like a research center and also the organization who uh, do the research on the gener general AI and that kind of. So we have a good community building right now, and we would like to, I, I think I'm the only Japanese uh, here in just this uh, symposium, so I would really love to have some kind of networks uh, 
within this um, the the person who is living uh, who, who is now here, and this is my this is the last slide I I have. So I think Japan has really unique ecosystem regarding like the robotics, artificial intelligence. So as you can see, uh, this is Apollo, the pet robot, and also the Ibo, the Sony released the newest. Um, pet robot, and also, uh, could, can you tell which which one is the robot? So this kind of robot, he he also he created a robot, and uh, he also created this telenoid robot. So the very um, opposite robot, so imitating the human beings and just the element of human beings. So th these are kind of uh, um, doing crazy things, but uh, um, I think. Uh, Maybe we could learn from the, this cultural differences, and uh, so, for example, he, here is like the the, the box. In there, there is a avatar or the VR, and this is the, the young ladies inside the box, and uh, it's kind of like a chat box. But uh, I think there contains a lots of like a gender problem and other things. However, I think uh, well, we need first to talk about wh why. There, there exist needs of this kind of thing, and what's the problem? What the ethical issues? And uh, that would be very, very interesting to start with. And uh, this will raise uh, many other questions, and maybe sometimes solutions to have the mutual understanding among the cultures. Thank you. So hi everyone, my, nom my name is Lucas Santana from Zabaf Social. And despite the theme of the talk, uh, it's not a good case of the AI or machine learning, but a bad one. Uh, according to National Bureau of Economic Research, black people wait 35% more for a ride in Uber. And according to Harvard Business School, people have 16 more percent to cancellations in Airbnb. In this area of these are cases of digital discrimination. Uh, these two examples are not exactly about AI, it's not exactly about machine learning, but these are examples of how people interact with each other uh, through the technology. Uh, the technology should be a good or a natural space, but can perpetuate a bad behavior of our society. Yesterday, we said that AI is a black box, and really is, sadly. To talk about a black box and the virtual invisible racism, the Zabaf Social made a campaign about photos of black people in bank of images. So let's see the first video. Why is white the standard? Why do we need to write the word black to find black people on the internet images search? Can you stop, please? That's how it happens on the photo stocks that feed the advertising and editorial market in Brazil. Desa this is the second one. Can you play the first, please? So we made these videos, we sent to Bank of Mages, uh, received some answers, some responses. So as you can see, black is not the standard, it's not the standard white society, it's not the standard, it's not the standard algorithm too. And the algorithm, and algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning are all around us and will be even more. The bias will continue to discriminate people just like happens every day in offline world. 
but now is invisible and it, that is dangerous. Now we're going to see the second video uh, with the results with uh, the results with uh, with the campaign and think about the, how to change the situation. The second video, please. Why is white the standard? Why do we need to write the word black to find black people on the internet images search? That's how it happens on the photo stocks that feed the advertising and editorial market in Brazil. Desabafo Social, an NGO that fights racism and for black representativity, has recorded videos of real searches and invited the photo stocks to talk about the problem. O que faz o que a gente chama de match das palavras com a busca, com os sites e, e etc., é o algoritmo que tem por trás. É possível sim, é só reeducar a máquina. Você faz o algoritmo primeiramente para poder ensinar ela o que está acontecendo e a partir dali ela já consegue ir sozinha. Some photo stocks replied. Others ignored the cause, avoiding dialogue. They reposition their communication, though. The public opinion helps spread it through. Drawing attention from an even bigger institution, we sat at the table to discuss the problem. Claro que é direcionado aos bancos de imagens, só que também tem uma questão de sociedade, né? Tanto a produção de imagens para esses bancos, que são mais procurados, quanto as pessoas que vão procurar e se questionar por quê o branco é o padrão, né? Bancos de imagens, buscadores, demos o primeiro passo. Mas quero lembrar que mudar o algoritmo é mudar a realidade. So, uh, algorithms are not neutral. So, algorithms are not neutral. There are some European standards that discourage to force, to force uh, their decisions made by algorithms to uh, must be understandable and explainable. Uh, IEEE, which I'm a member, has a huge role in it. In uh, comp big companies like Google, Uber, Facebook are the biggest agents. Uh, they are, the, they are the, the agents that can change the, the situation. And I'm glad, I'm glad that they are here. So these machines should, should be trained with diverse data and should be built by diverse people, which they are in right now. Nothing is going to change if the same black boxes are made by white men from Europe and North America. And nothing is going to change if the same people are here discussing how can this box can change with techno technical language. We need to pay attention to what black feminists are saying. We need to pay attention to what trans feminists are saying. We need to pay attention to what Africa is saying. We need to pay attention to what Latin America is saying. In what in how are they complaining? So right now, we need to think. You need to build some new and not black boxes. And let's reeducate the machine together. Because change the algorithms, it change the reality. Thank you. We're ready for some questions from the floor. Thank you very much for the three presenters. Uh, I think we have in this panel some ideas on what can be done to address the issues of inclusion. Uh, you can do stuff, you can create data, you can train data openly, uh, you can attack the silos of communities and make stakeholders talk together and reach more consensual and more inclusive decisions. You can start a debate with those who create algorithms and point them to the direction they might not have spotted, and some of them might reply to that. Uh, questions on the floor, please raise your hand. We have mics on both sides. Comments? There's one there. The 
Victor Akiwande, uh, IBM Research Africa. I just want to uh, talk about one initiative that I really uh, like, which is um, the AI for All initiative. Uh, I think more and more we need to see uh, such initiatives uh, take ground, uh, initiatives that actually uh, try to spread, um, edu uh, educate a generation, a next generation of AI technologies and actually push uh, for that to happen. Uh, one of the challenges is the very, very few AI experts. So, and these, these AI experts are being taken up by big companies, Google's, Facebook, Apple's, and the likes. And this is also a real challenge as well. So how can, so for example, um, researchers, professors, they, they leave um, research academia and then go to industry. How can we uh, come to an understanding that it's actually possible for them not to, um, more and more, we need to see more uh, researchers, academics actually work in industry, but not exactly leaving academia completely so that we don't, we have some way of ensuring that that knowledge is actually spread across and not just concentrated within um, silos. More hands. Thank you, only to congratulate your work and also to share that this story from Desabafo Social remembered me of the famous uh, Shirley cards, which were used by Kodak as a standard for photography since the 50s, if I'm not wrong. And only around 2000, they made a new card with women with other colors because the whole standard of revelation of films that we use for half a century was based in a white woman. So until today, when filmmakers try to use and film black people, they have to adjust this. And this is an example of technology reproducing the bias of a racist society. And I think algorithms are not free of that. So congratulations for raising this. One in the back, one here, and one there. Yeah, thank. Hello, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, these are such amazing examples. Thank, thank all of you so much for sharing them, and I am really especially like encouraged by the work that Desa Bafo Social has been able to do. I've been following the project for a while, and it's really great to see it getting like more visibility uh, and calling attention to that uh, inequality. Um, I just wanted to kind of like add on to the table. I know I've mentioned it before at the conference, but the, uh, the work of Joy Bulamwini who's with the Algorithmic Justice League, um, who's been looking at um, the intersection of race and gender in algorithmic bias. And so one of the suggested readings for, um, for this conference, right, was uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's uh, classic uh, paper on mapping the margins and on intersectionality. And um, but just like very, very specifically, as we all, in our different respective spheres, take forward the, uh, the analysis and the critique and especially the audit of algorithmic systems and the auditing of algorithmic bias, which means taking systems in different domains of life and analyzing the way that they distribute harms and benefits among different kinds, kinds of people. Um, Joy's work and other people's work um, can really make us focus on the fact that we can't only look for single identity categories when we're looking for bias. In other words, Joy has demonstrated that in the face recognition and gender classification uh, systems, the three most popular ones, they do best at mapping uh, sort of white male faces, second best at mapping white female faces, third at black male, and fourth at the bottom is black female faces. So if we don't pay attention to the way that intersecting inequality of race, class, gender, and other axes, uh, disability, and so on, um, the way that they work together, um, even when we're constructing our audits, um, we're not going to actually be effectively uh, monitoring the inequalities that AR, AIs are reproducing. So. We have one question here. Very intrigued by that, um, by these nine uh, principles or whatever you want to call them. Um, when you said that, um, you see that AI is also um, bound by the first eight, and that you see that as a an idea of um, 
um, regarding AI more as a partner than as a tool. And I, I would just like to ask you to tell us a little more about that, to elaborate on that, because there's that huge discussion about attributing agency and free will and what will you to AI, and that's very contested, and uh, it seems to be a very different concept that you have, and I'd just like to know more about that. What is that, one, two? Yeah, um, so, yeah, I, I think um, this is really controversial. Um, uh, the nine, the nine article is very controversial, and uh, uh, we actually, when we creating this principle, we had a debate about whether we should include that into the principle. However, um, we thought we uh, th there's if you go to the website on the this ethical guidelines, there's uh, the chair is uh, writing some statement or like explanation why we include this, this not article 9 and uh, they he said that uh, considering that the japanese people traditionally consider like uh, the robots as a, the friends like a Doraemon and Astro Boy and the other stuff rather than terminator and that and uh, many japanese researchers actually aims to well r read that kind of cartoons and animation and their motivation to do research is to create that kind of friendly ai and uh, so so that's why he wanted to uh, include well well, the, most of the AI researchers wanted to include this into the uh, the article. However, um, so like uh, um, whether we 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 put the the right uh, the robot rights or like the whether the robot has duty or that that kind of issues is, is really um, very um, kind of getting messy right now. However, so. We, we were not uh, actually seriously discussing that into the depths. However, by writing down this article, we, we want to uh, start the conversation with the public. Well, what is the, um, what, 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 what is the relationship between humans and robots and how we could uh, um, promote the, well, what, what is the friendly AI or the, what is, what, what's the element we should um, study or like, so what is the security, what is the privacy, and that so on. So this is just a start to discuss uh, the thing. And uh, I think uh, we, are, we are just writing the code of ethics and how we motivate to create that kind of AI. So next step, what we have to do is like to think about the AI ethics. So is it really, so, what, to, so right now we, the ethical board, only have like a social scientist and also the AI researchers, but we need to include the lawyers and the policy makers and other stuff to discuss this kind of big issue. So we're, we are still on the, in the process of discussing it, but I think uh, posing this kind of concept like AI as a partner is really interesting to uh, discuss. And I think Danit has something to say from this East Asia. So I think we have uh, one question there, here, and then I'll get two more, and then five more, and then I close. So please. Hi, um, Joe from Amnesty International. Uh, it's more just a comment, just to say thank you for the uh, inspiring examples. I, I couldn't agree more that what is needed here is is building a real movement of citizens who 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 are in various different ways uh, challenging uh, the, the the power structures that exist at the moment and and trying to empower people to uh, you know uh, understand how these systems are working and and how we can um, hold them more accountable and more transparent. I mean, I think. Um, it has to be a combination of what we've already been talking about, some of the long-term research that builds the evidence base, but as well as that, combined with some of the great sort of short-term campaigns on um, on particular companies, like in the example that you that you gave with the uh, with the shutter, Shutterstock and and others. Um, and I think um, looking forward a little bit, I would also think. I also think it's important that we um, that we demand transparency through freedom of information requests and and testing the legal limits of um, the existing legal frameworks to be able to uh, reveal as much as is possible in order to then 
subsequently find where there are gaps and uh, that, that, that require new policy solutions to, to resolve? Okay, I will just speak, those who can hear, can hear. Um, I also just want to echo everyone and thank you for this really inspiring examples. Uh, Lucas, the work that you're doing is fantastic. It reminds me in 2013 when um, Google had a similar problem with auto, auto search complete, because if on Google, for example, if you typed in uh, female scientists, it gave you a suggestion saying, didn't you mean male scientists? Because the category of female scientists did not, it was too rare for people to be searching for, so they presume that you had made a typo uh, at that point. Um, but I, I do actually want to uh, highlight the point that I also find it really reassuring that when you reach out to these companies, there is equal willingness for them to have a conversation. I think oftentimes this becomes this very stakeholder silo thing about them being bad and us being like the moral vanguards of whatever. And I think it's important to realize that these are questions that are equally hounding people who are working with big databases and algorithms. And sometimes we just have to trigger them into having those conversations. Sometimes it needs more pressure, more public, um, uh, public policy work or public advocacy work. But I find it really reassuring that there is an opening up of space for conversation like that. So thanks for highlighting mm -hmm. that in that instance. And I had a very uh, nuts and bolts question for Mark. I just loved the examples that you were talking about. And I know that Mozilla is not a regular kind of a company, but it is still a company. I'm just very curious about how are you um, imagining the kind of examples that you are giving as having democratization potentials just because of the cost that goes into these things. So just to give a brief example, two weeks ago I was at the um, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign campus, which is one of the five supercomputers in the world. So I visited Blue Waters, uh, Deep Waters, for example, um, and they told me that this supercomputer, which is housed in a land grab university in the US and supported by the university, is so expensive that their students can only afford to use 8% of its computational power, whereas everything else has to be given to the different uh, kind of people who can afford to pay for it, right? So we do talk a lot about empowering civil society to take back the tech. We talk about how we should all be using AI applications, but the incredible amount of cost that goes into computation makes it almost formidable for a lot of smaller organizations in the Global South to work together towards it. I'm just curious how you would respond to it, but also give us an idea of what next steps could be uh, for smaller organizations, especially organizations that are not necessarily dealing with AI as the core focus to kind of reappropriate and get assimilated into this network and ecosystem. Okay, I have time for more two questions. There is one person there waiting lots. So, but we start there and then we end there. Sorry for the short time. Okay, so yes, yes, yes. let me make it easier for you. It's not a question, it's just yeah. a quick comment. Um, to people talking about AI as a partner versus as a tool, this is a, an, a narrative that is not very well known to a lot of people, but is actually very, very common in, in East Asia. And I think that we have to keep an open mind when we think about this and, and approaching this, because this is something that is, is very kind of new and, and unique, but I feel like Arisa was telling about the, the why is this happening. There are so many different considerations, and this is research that I do about the emotional need for meaningful companionship through artificial intelligence. And there is a, I mean, the, the hologram at the bottom, people testified that it was the most meaningful relationship they've ever had. And the robot that looked like a weird kind of kid thingy is a robot that is used to prevent dementia um, for the elderly. And there is this really interesting narrative about AI becoming a partner, which I think is going to become much more prevalent as, as we progress. Um, it's very common in, in a certain area right now, but I think it's really going to change. And I would like to encourage people to think about this kind of thing and also to think about the implications of including AI, not just having an eye on inclusion, also including AI in the sense of AI becoming a quasi-member, even member of society. Thank you. So let's get a last question over there, and then I'll go for... Um final round of closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers. Uh, your presentations were very um, interesting. Uh, I guess my comment, my name is Julian and I come from Uganda. 
Um, and my comment is in, in relation to case studies, the African problem would be how do we make the few case studies more visible such that the AI and inclusion discussion can happen there as well. Thank you. Okay. So, should we do a final remarks? Mark, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Well, thank you for all the comments, and it was inspiring to hear you guys as, as well. Um, I think on Nishan's question, maybe as a, then to wrap it into some other things, I mean, Mozilla, as, as maybe most people here already know, is a nonprofit and was kind of founded as a nonprofit with this idea that there was going to be no other way to take on Microsoft in the browser market than through open source and through volunteerism. Uh, and, you know, Firefox has been successful, so it means there's a, a different economics than in the beginning, but I think that's still the roots that we imagine people getting together to challenge the centralization of power on the internet is something that is worth doing uh, and is, can have an impact. And so there's two parts of that in how we do it. And you know, the first part relates to your question, Nishant. One is as a social enterprise, and then the other is you know, more you know, trying to encourage things like what Lucas is doing uh, as a social movement part of the organization. So we have both of those aspects of the organization. On the social enterprise and the technology piece, I think you know, the computing power one is uh, one of the barriers in terms of people getting into AI, whether it's civil society organizations, small entrepreneurs, even medium-sized companies in places outside of you know, the big five tech companies in the US. And you know, the one that we're first poking at is the machine learning big data sets as a thing that maybe we can democratize more, and that's even a tiny experiment. So that's a theory of one thing to do. You know, the question of how you deal with the computing power one is there large parallel distributed systems that citizens could build? So could you imagine SETI at home, but for citizen AI or for small company AI or as cooperatives? So I think those are exactly the kind of questions where huge resource centralizations, whether that's through whatever NSF or DARPA funding is paying for that supercomputer or what Facebook is able to do in, in data centers, we do want to find ways and push on that to counterbalance power. And I think it's... I mean, it doesn't have to happen. We may fail, but I think there's a lot of people starting to say now, how do we reconceptualize the idea of free software as a distributed disruptive force in the era of AI? So we don't have all the answers to that, that Common Voice or other things are like starting to ask that question. And then, but to your other point, like how do smaller civil society organizations have an impact? I mean, you, that's amazing. You guys build on the history of, you know, basically consumer activism in a way that, is very fresh and related incisively to specifically the everyday experiences we have uh, of biased algorithms. And like, you're not talking about the abstraction of algorithms. These are the products we all, I mean, how many people did an image search of any kind in the last month in this room, right? These are the everyday realities of the technology we live inside of. And so, I mean, that's the other side of it. You don't have to get into open source AI to have an impact on how this is doing. I mean, you guys are, are having an impact. Um, I give the word to Arisa and Lucas and Just Technology. If you saw a woman at the end of the movie, is Moniki, she's sitting over there. So you can also talk to her after the break. Arisa, do you want to closing remarks? Lucas, wanna go? Uh, so about the question of Sasha, uh, yes, you are 100% right about it. We need to uh, to in text on, uh, we need to bring more conversations mm -hmm. uh, and bring more, more problems. This, this campaign was about one, about race. Uh, it's about social, it is a, a race, and Joe, a race. On, we talk a, a lot about race, and this is why we did, uh, we did this. And about the talk, to talk with companies, uh, after this video, after this campaign, uh, we, read, we had a day with Google to talk about this campaign, about all the uh, other campaigns with all the problems. Uh, so uh, we are trying to talk and uh, start a conversation with companies, too, which is really important. So thank you. 
Um, so, like, uh, when I came from Japan, like, the discussion uh, in this symposium, this conference, is some, somehow um, really new to me because, you know, Japanese, well, we have, like, uh, many, um, like, uh, many people living, like, the, from, like, Philippines or the Brazil or, like, the Koreans. However, Japan, we talk Japanese, and uh, every Japanese, well, East Asian people have the same color, and we don't actually, we, we say that there is an algorithm bias, but uh, it's not a really real problem. However, well, when, we, when I hear many discussions here, I think it's really important, and I think Japanese also have to uh, consider and contribute to this kind of communication. So I would really love to continue this kind of discussion and maybe we could talk about like AI as a partner or tool and that kind of uh, things uh, in the next, uh, next time or like tomorrow or this afternoon. Thank you. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, one last uh, advert. Tomorrow, 9.30 to 10, there's breakfast here. So there's something the program called informal meetings and other things. There will be food, so you can talk and eat. Uh, so 9.30 tomorrow, there will be breakfast here, uh, served here. Uh, thank you very much for the panel. Thank you very much for the audience, and see you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>